It is Friday, January 26th, and this is The National. Tonight, singing their hearts out can ruin their vocal cords. How a changing music business is sidelining major stars. There's supposed to be high-flying family fun. We look at the sometimes deadly dangers at trampoline parks. But we begin with news in a high-profile criminal case. Official confirmation of what the victim's family has been saying all along. We have sufficient evidence to describe this as a double homicide investigation and that both Honey and Barry Sherman were in fact targeted. The case began with confusing messages from police and outrage from the victim's family. But now, six weeks after the billionaire couple was found dead in their Toronto home, police were finally crystal clear this was a double murder. Investigators confirmed some of the ugly details of the case today, and Lorenda Redekop has the latest on their hunt for suspects. Police broke their six-week silence today and finally outlined what they believe happened to the Shermans at their Toronto home. Honey and Barry Sherman were found deceased in the lower-level pool area, hanging by belts from a poolside railing in a semi-seated position. That pool is pictured here on the Sherman's real estate listing. Their home was up for sale and many people had access to a key through the lockbox. Those are some of the people police are talking to because there was no sign of a forced entry. Police say they've interviewed 127 people, combed through the couple's three-story home and they have thousands of hours worth of security camera footage from neighbours. Police also seized computers from Barry Sherman's offices, and yet... We haven't developed any suspects outside, outside of understanding that people are outstanding for, or a person is outstanding for this offence. The couple was loved by many. They had high-profile friends. They also donated millions to charities. Barry Sherman was known for battles in the courts over the years, as founder of the multi-billion dollar generic drug company, Apotex. But as for why someone would want to kill the couple... I'm not going to discuss any motives. Friends, just like the Sherman family, were sure from the start this was a double murder. I don't think uh, very many people believed uh, in the rumor uh, that was never substantiated, but uh, of murder-suicide. The couple's friend, Paul Godfrey, owns a condo in the same complex in Florida as the Shermans. Police confirmed today they also searched that Sherman residence. Longtime friend Murray Rubin had hoped for more answers. I was disappointed. I'm looking for somebody to be involved to a point where they have a, a, a person that they're looking into. He also says he misses his friend. I miss him every day. I miss him all the time. I think about him all the time. Today, police officially handed over the property to the Sherman family. Now, for the first time, their private investigators will get their chance to search the home. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. The family released this brief statement today. This conclusion was expressed by the family from the outset and is consistent with the findings of the independent autopsy and investigation. The family continues to support the Toronto Police Services in their efforts to seek justice for their parents and pursue those responsible for these unspeakable crimes. There was a question for police at the news conference. Why are police now saying murder when murder-suicide seemed to be floated so early on? Here was the response. I've been the officer in charge of this investigation from the moments that it occurred or certainly when we got contacted, and I don't know where that came from. So where did that notion come from? How did the family and police get so far apart so fast? It all seemed to happen in the first 36 hours. 11.44 a.m., December 15th, Toronto police get the call. It's understood to have come from the Sherman's real estate agent handling the house sale. The agent was also a family friend. Police send out a tweet, two people found deceased in a home. Word that those people were Barry and Honey Sherman spread fast. The couple was last seen on the 13th, a source close to the case told CBC Honey Sherman was still wearing the clothes she'd had on two days earlier. CBC has also learned she appeared to have been bloodied and injured before she died. 4.30 p.m. December 15th, the police first speak to the media. The circumstances of their death appear suspicious. 
But other than not dying of natural causes, what did suspicious mean? 8 p.m., another statement from police. It was not at all alarming. We did not observe any signs of uh, forced entry to the, to the building. Um, and so uh, at this point, uh, indications are that we have no outstanding suspect to uh, be going after. That's not directly saying murder-suicide, but it certainly left the impression police were thinking about that. No appearance of an urgent search for killers who might be on the loose. The next day, December 16th, media reports quoting unnamed sources within the police floated the murder-suicide theory. CBC has learned it was the Saturday morning the Sherman children reached out to private investigators who would later have access to crime scene photos and a second autopsy. Less than 24 hours after their parents' bodies were found, they were already furious with police. 4.14 p.m. December 16th, they released this statement. We're shocked and think it's irresponsible that police sources have reportedly advised the media of a theory which neither their family, their friends, nor their colleagues believed to be true. The family was clear. The Shermans had been killed. It would be at least another day before the homicide squad took the lead. Now, six weeks after the bodies were found, the police publicly say they agree the Shermans were murdered. So on the one hand, Barry Sherman was a billionaire philanthropist described lovingly by family and friends. On the other, he was the head of a drug company who picked more than a few fights which is why we've brought in Harvey Kishore, producer with the Fifth Estate. Harvey, I know that, that you're investigating the Sherman story right. for a fifth documentary mm -hmm. coming up soon, and that the, the fact that, that he and his company were so litigious is, plays a big part of it. The extremely important part. We know in federal court alone that there were more lawsuits involving Barry Sherman and his competition than anybody else in, in Canada. You know, one of the, the, my sources told me that one of the strategies of Barry Sherman was to get all the law firms here in Toronto locked up so the competition couldn't have those good law firms. So we talked to investigative journalist Jeffrey Robinson who talked to us about the cutthroat, cutthroat nature of the pharmaceutical industry. And here's a clip. He was the biggest and the most successful and had made a lot of enemies and was extremely litigious and was continuing to be so, didn't care about making friends, didn't care about making peace with anybody. He was going to win at all costs. Okay, so he's describing someone who's a successful businessman, very aggressive about protecting his business. Right. All kind of understandable. None of this seems to explain a motive for trying to kill him. Though. No, and let's be clear. These were pillars of the community. They contributed millions to charity. They were well-liked and admired and respected in the, in the community. But we do know in the pharmaceutical industry, it got personal. And for example, there was a name brand company in Europe that actually discussed uh, putting him in compromising positions, planting cocaine on him, you know, uh, compromising sexual positions, that kind of thing. And when that didn't work, they actually hired spies to go to the picnic tables at Apotex, dress up as workers, and talk to employees to try and get dirt on Barry Sherman. Was he ever afraid? Did you get that sense? Well, we do know that Apotex once said that Barry Sherman did get death threats. And when he talked to investigative journalist Jeffrey Robinson, he actually did sort of say, you know, I do wonder why no one has actually, you know, whacked me that, um, you know, more that he said it jokingly or on, on a serious, he did think about whether he could have been killed uh, in the work that he was doing. He, in his paranoia, wondered if maybe somebody should have knocked him off by now, because that would have ended the whole problem for the other side. And he said something like, uh, you know, I, for a thousand dollars, he said, for a thousand dollars, you can probably get somebody killed. But the way he said it didn't set off alarm bells. And yet yeah, here we are. Yeah. And we don't know what motives the police might suspect of whoever did this. What we do know is that Barry Shimon did collect a, a, you know, a list of enemies that were quite extensive. What a shame. Okay, Harvey yeah. Kishore, thanks very much. Your, Thank your you. documentary airs next week on the Fifth Estate. That's right. Meanwhile, there's been a change in leadership at the company Barry Sherman built. Jeremy Desai resigned as president and CEO of Apotex Pharmaceuticals today in the midst of a lawsuit filed by a competing company. That suit alleges he acquired trade secrets from one of their employees. And Ian, you are following the latest fallout today at the Ontario legislature. There's a lot of it. And Adrian, the Progressive uh, Conservative Party of Ontario scrambling to get back into election mode after the departure of former leader Patrick Brown over those allegations of sexual misconduct. And the party wants to distance itself even further from him. Together with caucus, I am asking Mr. Brown to take a leave of absence from the Ontario PC caucus while he has a chance to defend himself. 
But as the party aimed to focus on the future, the Brown scandal threatened to grab the spotlight again. One of its own caucus members prompting questions about what the party knew about Brown's alleged behavior and when. Here's Ron Charles. This progressive conservative politician says she heard rumors about Patrick Brown sometime before Christmas. Yeah, just, just, just inappropriate touching or, or multiple girlfriends. Ottawa area MPP Lisa McLeod says she passed them on, but not to any Tory party officials. I want to be very clear that it was uh, some rumors and it was an allegation that I, I gave that was not completely specific, but I was unsurprised when this happened. And it was to, uh, it was to a friend of mine, Dimitri Soudis, Dimitri Soudis is best known from his role as a controversial communications director for former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Soudis is now a consultant who had been volunteering on Brown's campaign. Today, Soudis tweeted confirmation that McLeod came to him with rumors and allegations, but no specific details. He says he told her to bring them up with Brown. He sure also like tweeted that McLeod told him the rumors came from uh, Eric Lindros. The retired NHL player could not be reached for comment. All of this was a backdrop to the drama of the Tories filling their leadership void. The elected members chose North Bay MPP Victor Fideli as interim leader. He and some of his caucus colleagues argued that he should be the one to lead them into the June provincial election in order to avoid a potentially fractious leadership race. We are smack dab in the middle of an election campaign. So <laughs> what I said this morning was, you know, are we going to spend time uh, uh, in fighting and shooting ourselves in the foot and then limping over to an election and joining an election uh, months later? But under pressure from members and potential candidates, the party executive took the unprecedented step of planning a leadership race on the eve of an election. I can assure you that when this is finished, before the end of March, we will be ready to take on government. He says the party is still figuring out precisely how the new leader will be chosen. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Today brought an ardent defense for the ousted leader, Patrick Brown, from his sister. What happened to my brother was disgusting, and make no mistake, he is the victim. Stephanie Brown said in a statement, these completely false allegations were 100% politically motivated. Applauding accusers who remain nameless ghosts to bolster political capital, pathetic. CTV says its longtime Queen's Park reporter Paul Bliss has been suspended pending an investigation after sexual misconduct allegations were made online. Bell Media, which owns CTV, says it's taking the allegations very seriously. And in Montreal, Concordia University issuing guidelines now to faculty and staff in the wake of allegations against two English professors. The university discourages in the strongest possible terms any consensual, romantic or sexual relationships between instructors and their students. Concordia says it can't prohibit it, but there are strict obligations for instructors to disclose those relationships or risk disciplinary action. There is big news on the trade front today, a nearly 300% tariff that the Trump administration wanted to slap on Bombardier's C-Series commercial jet has been overturned. When the U.S. Commerce Department levied the duty last year, the sheer size of it was a surprise, more than twice what U.S. aerospace giant Boeing had actually asked for. But today, the U.S. International Trade Commission ruled Boeing suffered no harm from Bombardier's jet and struck down the tariff. Bombardier's stock price surged by about 15% on the news. And the CBC's Katie Simpson has more reaction to the Bombardier decision and the latest on that other big Canada-U.S. trade dispute. A sigh of relief on the front lines of Canada's aerospace industry. Few had predicted Bombardier would see a day like this. It's a great victory for us, and it's a victory for innovation, for competition. And I want to thank everybody that supported us in this. While the government is also pleased, it's not yet ready to celebrate. This decision, however, by the four U.S. Trade Commissioners, unanimous, is not the final stage in this process. It can still go up to an international tribunal and then, of course, eventually end up at the Supreme Court of the United States. So there's still more steps to go. We'll see. The initial trade win comes as Canada and Mexico continue to battle it out with the U.S. at the NAFTA negotiating table. Some watching the talks hope the ruling sends a message to Donald Trump and his negotiators. So this is really about Trump 
is bullying tactics, pushing Canada around. Same thing that's going on in the softwood lumber dispute. Same thing that's going on in this hotel right now with NAFTA. Trump delivered more ambiguous messages today about NAFTA at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Will it be renegotiated? We're trying right now with Bob Lighthouser and the whole group. I think we have a good chance, but we'll see what happens. But business leaders who met in Montreal to discuss the talks appear somewhat optimistic about progress in this round, after Canada presented a series of compromises on the biggest challenges at the table. I think it would be premature to say that anybody is buying anything in, into anything at this point, but I think what there is is at least discussion taking place in all of these areas that proposals aren't being rejected out of hand. Progress may seem slow here in Montreal, but there's enough momentum that insiders are now starting to talk about adding new rounds of negotiations. If extra talks are added, it would be a sign that discussions are headed in a positive direction. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Montreal. Some thought Donald Trump was going to Davos to chastise the gathering of global-minded leaders. Instead, today, he seemed to charm them. Trump's speech, the first from a U.S. president at the World Economic Forum in 18 years, softened the America First rhetoric of his stateside rallies. America first does not mean America alone. When the United States grows, so does the world. But he didn't get much fire and fury from the Davos crowd. The Saudis held a reception in his honor. European executives lavished him with attention. There was one moment of discord. Take a listen to this. I realized how nasty, how mean, how uh, vicious, and how fake the press can be as the cameras start going off in the back. <laughs> Those were boos from the crowd during one of his uh, typical attacks on the media. It's so interesting. That wasn't the first time he mentioned fake news at Davos. So he was asked about the reports that he actually tried to fire Robert Mueller, the special counsel, probing, among other things, his campaign. He, he called it, you know, a, you heard it, typical New York Times fake stories. But the thing is, that report has been independently confirmed by several news outlets, including Fox. Well, here's what else we're following on The National tonight. As the BBC struggles with how much it pays its men compared to women, some damage control, but not everyone is satisfied with the BBC's highest paid men taking a pay cut. And from Celine Dion to Adele, why are so many big name singers being temporarily silenced by vocal cord problems? But first, we'll look at safety at trampoline parks in Canada and calls tonight for tighter regulations. Got somebody diving into something? You would think that there should be certain standards in terms of the depth of the foam pit, the landing, that kind of thing. But first, let's talk to one of the strangest men of our time, artist Salvador Dali. His weird and wonderful paintings sometimes bewilder the public, much as he himself bewildered our seven days reporter. Mr. Dali, some people think that you were a crackpot. Do you know what a crackpot is? Uh, crack? No. A crackpot. A crazy person. Yes, uh, but this is not absolutely exact. Because ten many times, Dali is almost crazy. But look, only difference between one crazy people and Dali is Dali is not crazy, but almost. Some critics say, Mr. Dali, that you're not serious about art. It's true. Dali is never serious about anything because I'm Spanish and my character is not serious but tragical. And never Dali make one joke. Never. How do you feel when people laugh at your works? And some people do, sir. I don't think it's uh, normal because it's, uh, the laughing is the fierce mechanism of defense. What do you think of pop art? Ah, very good question. Because uh, Dali believes pop art is the consequence 
of early Dalinian ideas. Why do you wear two ties, Mr. Dowling? Uh, this is, uh, is uh, because uh, today is Thanksgiving. Drake Private Detectives? Detective Murdoch? What's the connection? There's your answer. Smuggling, kidnapping, murder. I like to keep an open mind. No crime is unsolvable. Some simply take longer than others. This is my favorite part. We're off to catch the culprit. I intend to prove it scientifically. Well, we like a challenge. Times change. Put your eyes back in your head, Henry. What's going on here? You think about, um, you know, playgrounds. You think about diving boards. There's there's stuff set so that people don't get hurt and. And for, for these parks to just blow up one after the other, after the other, after the other, and, and they're being built by the hundreds now, um, to not have a, a set in stone, you know, regulation is, is insane, I think. Families in Western Canada are raising concerns about the lack of regulations or safety standards for trampoline parks in this country. This comes after a fatal incident at a park in B.C. last weekend and another troubling case near Edmonton last year. Rafi Bujakanian looks at what's being done. It was supposed to be a fun-filled day at a trampoline park, not unlike this one. But for Landon Smith, it turned out to be the last day he walked. I thought, uh, I definitely thought I was going to die in that pit. Smith was attempting a front flip into a foam pit at this Edmonton area trampoline park, but he says he hit concrete instead. That split second, my head, life had changed forever. He isn't the only one. In Richmond, British Columbia, police are investigating a horrific incident. Last weekend, Jay Greenwood died in front of his daughters after jumping into a foam pit. Health Canada says that between 2012 and 2016, Canadian emergency rooms reported 563 trampoline park-related injuries involving minors. 3.2% of cases resulted in a traumatic brain injury. The Smiths have filed a lawsuit against the trampoline park where Landon Smith lost his mobility. The park's management would not speak to us, but in a statement of defense, it pointed out Smith signed an electronic waiver, denied he struck his head on concrete and said the facility was safe. But for Smith's lawyer, there are questions. You've got somebody diving into something. You would think that there should be certain standards in terms of the depth of the foam pit, the landing, that kind of thing. As for Landon Smith, he spoke to CBC before leaving for treatment in the U.S. Landon's always been uh, the stubborn sibling, I guess, uh, over even myself. So that was, uh, I mean, if this is going to happen to anybody and if anybody's going to, you know, beat the odds, it's, it's definitely him. Their question now, whether stories like Landon's and Greenwood's will prevent others from getting hurt. Rafi Bujikani in CBC News, Edmonton. And it seems like a lot of people are getting into the trampoline business. According to the International Association of Trampoline Parks, there were just three in 2009. By the end of last year, there were more than 1,000. And it appears there has been a corresponding jump in injuries. Researchers at the Connecticut Children's Medical Center looked at emergency room statistics related to trampoline parks in the United States. It found the number of visits rose from 581 back in 2010 almost 7,000 just four years later. We have lots more ahead tonight on The National. They are pushing their voices to unhealthy heights. Big stars are being forced to cancel shows because of trouble with their vocal cords. We'll look at the medical lengths some are going to to get their voices back. But first, more fallout tonight at the BBC over how much it pays men and women. I support my female colleagues who've rightly said that they should be paid the same uh, when they're doing the same job. It's, it's just a no-brainer. Is there anything that you, in the way you approach your work that changed after the staggering success of, of Pulp Fiction? Is no. there something you do different now that you didn't do then? Is there something you want to do now that you didn't then? No. I mean, what I'm saying is, that, did that was that that significant a change? Was that a real fork in the road? That no, it was um, an opportunity to now 
be able to choose better roles mm -hmm. or get scripts at a different level. Uh, say I uh, now get things from the ground floor rather than once they've been conceptualized, picked up, mm -hmm. put a director on. I get things now before there's even even a director attached to it, mm -hmm. or they even have a studio commitment. And it still amazes me that sometimes people do need me to get that kind of commitment from other people. Mm -hmm. So um, that changes in that way. But the way I approach the roles and the preparation that I do to make the role happen for me and to make it happen for an audience hasn't changed. Um, that's one of those things that I kind of feel like, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I've achieved, I guess, um, this level of success because of the way that I approach my work. And I think that if I change it, something else will change. Maybe I won't get the same results. And does that, um, that feeling that some movies need your name to get this person to attach to it, does that allow you to relax? Do you, do you feel yourself allowing, allowing yourself to relax a bit and not agonizing? I'm relaxed on? anyway. So you never agonized even before that? No. I always know that I'm, I am going to work for somebody. Mm -hmm. And whether it's um, in a lead role or a supporting role, those issues cease to be important to me. It's mostly about picking a story that I think that's, that's interesting and that, number one, I would pay my money to go and see because mm -hmm. I'm essentially an audience member. I love movies. Mm -hmm. I pay my money to go and see them. And when I read a script, I read it like an audience member. Would I sit here and be interested, or do I know what's going to happen on page 75 and I'm only on page 12? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm making those kinds of decisions. And going into a role and the kind of people that I'm going to work with, hopefully the work experience is uh, going to be great. I mean, I've had like a great year this year. Mm -hmm. I looked up one day and I'm doing this great dramatic scene and I look across from me and you know there's Dustin Hoffman mm -hmm. and I'm saying to myself, oh my God, I'm working with Dustin Hoffman, but I'm in the middle of the scene so I can't stop doing it to be in awe of that. And I do it and I get through it and it's great to look at him and see him looking at me like, that was great, you know, and that gives you another feeling of accomplishment because you know, I've watched Dustin for years. Mm -hmm. And then another day you look and there's Robert De Niro and I'm doing the same thing. It's like, oh my God, that's Robert De Niro. And I'm doing a scene with him and it's happening. And, you know, <laughs> then last week, <laughs> well, no, earlier this week, actually, I'm standing on set and I'm doing a scene and I'm talking to this character and the character's reacting and we're having this great scene. And right in the middle of it, I say to myself, oh my God, that's Yoda. Look at that. <laughs> so I've had a great year. I've gone from Dustin Hoffman to Robert De Niro to Yoda. So things like that mean a lot, you know. I'm wondering if, if the, uh, <laughs> the experience of producing Eve's Bayou was such that you wish to repeat it. Oh yeah, well I have projects that are in development mm -hmm. that um, are you know, short stories that I've optioned or novels that I've had optioned for me that are in development uh, and some of those scripts are about to come in. And uh, not only will I be in them, I'll be one of the producers. So that's you know, part and parcel of what happens. And I am now actively seeking projects. Uh, that are specifically uh, for me mm -hmm. and I guess in that comes the job of producing it also. <laughs>On The National Tonight, former hostage Joshua Boyle has been ordered to undergo a psychological assessment. He's also facing more charges. They're connected to incidents that allegedly took place after he and his family were released from captivity in Afghanistan last fall. Among the 19 charges he now faces, sexual assault with a weapon and unlawful confinement. The family of a good Samaritan killed last month in Hamilton has launched a $10 million lawsuit naming the city's paramedics, police, and the hospital where he died. They claim the failure to properly treat Yosef Al-Hasnawi contributed to his death. Police say the 19-year-old was shot while trying to stop an altercation on the street. Paramedics took him to hospital 38 minutes after they got to the scene. When you look at the scope of everything, that's the reason I made a choice to retire now, and I hope that it has a little bit, a little bit of helping that healing process. The athletic director of Michigan State University announced his departure today as the fallout continues from the Larry Nassar sex abuse scandal. 
USA Gymnastics has also announced that its entire board of directors will resign. The departures come after Nasser, a former sports doctor who worked at the university, was sentenced after admitting to molesting girls and women. Among his victims were some of U.S.'s top Olympic gymnasts. They've criticized USA Gymnastics for failing to protect them. My family's life has forever been changed. My three children are growing up without a daddy. No judgment will bring these men back. No judgment will ever make amends. No judgment will ever make reparations. That is the widow of RCMP Constable Doug Larsh speaking outside the courthouse in Moncton today, where the Mounties were hit with a rare half-million-dollar punishment. The force must pay out $550,000, to be exact, for failing to properly equip officers before that shooting rampage in June of 2014. The Mounties were fined $100,000. The rest is being split up among agencies that help families of workers injured on the job, university scholarships, and education funds for the fallen officers' children. We, we can never forget our fallen, ever. Uh, and we will never forget. Three years after the Moncton murders, the RCMP was convicted of workplace safety violations, essentially for not providing officers with high-powered carbine rifles against a heavily armed man. I feel very strongly that my husband would have been alive today had the RCMP done their due diligence. The court did know the RCMP is improving its practices. This is something we're going to continue to work on to ensure that our member uh, I have the equipment training required for officer safety. My hope is that the RCMP officers in charge will put members' safety first when making decisions so that those RCMP members that are out there today that protect us will be, will be better protected themselves. There's still more to be done. A lawyer for the RCMP says the force will decide within the next 30 days whether to appeal the conviction and the sentence. A lot of attention has been focused on the troubles of the inquiry into the murder to missing Indigenous women and girls, but the inquiry's work continues this week in Yellowknife. My sister had um, lots of friends and we had, like one of the police officers at the time, he was a family friend of ours. And I always remember seeing him. And when I walked in the door, I, I seen him. And just the way he looked at me is, I knew something was wrong. <laughs> and I didn't want it to be true or anything, but to see this police officer standing there crying, I knew, I knew for sure. And I took up running, and he grabbed me because I was I don't know what I was going to do or what was happening, but he held on to me and he told me I'll be okay. And it took, it took a little while for me to actually go into the emergency room to see her and she wasn't breathing then. That was Jada Andre recounting the moment she discovered her sister had been fatally stabbed. The inquiry's work in Yellowknife exposed the wounds people carry, the wounds they inflict, and also, as Briar Stewart tells us, a vital need. <laughs> Whether on foot, thank you, or in a van. Lydia Bardak is a familiar face to many in Yellowknife as she tries to deal with all too familiar problems. That's only time they said I could go there. This man was kicked out of the day shelter here and is trying to figure out where to warm up in minus 25 degree cold. In Yellowknife, a city of just 20,000, Bardock estimates there are as many as 400 people homeless and in need of much more than just a place to live. The extent and the depth of mental health issues here in the north, it's enormous. Um, people are packing so much with them in terms of trauma, uh, unresolved grief and loss. Those common struggles have been brought up again and again at the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Families from across the territory testified in Yellowknife this week. Maybe things would have been different, like maybe... Maybe we all could have got help sooner. Jada Andre spoke about her sister Joni, 
who was killed by her husband in the hamlet of Fort McPherson. The Northwest Territories has one of the highest rates of domestic violence in Canada, which is why Bardak believes the inquiry can't just be looking at ways to help women. I know that we want to focus on the women, but the women are asking for help for their men. And if women are in violent relationships, frontline workers say it can be hard to find a safe place to turn. Some small communities don't have shelters, and others are frequently at capacity. Physical health would be nice if we Bree Denning that. says this is supposed to be an emergency shelter, but some women have been here for years. So typically, how many people would stay here in a given night? Um, 24. She says they stay because they don't have anywhere else to go. A lot of women have given up. Uh, we make it hard for them. And so Denning says it can take a few months to get an appointment with a mental health counselor, while others are told they have to leave the territory. It isn't right that they can choose between um, accessing the care that they need and being in the north. So it's amazing what we're doing. She says the social problems here have been well documented, so she isn't sure what difference the inquiry will make in the end. Of course I'm skeptical, but at least they're asking the questions and people have their moment to speak. I've had lots of faith in you. And articulate for themselves the types of changes many have been calling for for years. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Yellow Knight. Thank you for sharing the good memory. The next community hearings for the inquiry are scheduled for February 20th in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut, and the participants are likely prepared. The Rankin Inlet hearings were originally scheduled for December, but were postponed. Some of the BBC's top announcers aren't just reading the news today, they are in it. Some men reducing their salaries. We have to actually push governments and institutions and embarrass them to actually take action. And in 2018, which um, incidentally is nearly 50 years after this country's Equal Pay Act, it simply is not good enough. It is a very public spat over equal pay at Britain's public broadcaster. Female announcers asking why they're making less money for the same work. With salaries made public and its staff in revolt, it's all pretty awkward for the BBC, as Margaret Evans explains. The British Broadcasting Corporation, so much a part of the national fabric that even its headquarters feels a little iconic. Its image, though, is taking a hit in a scandal over unequal pay between men and women. Six male BBC presenters agree a salary cut. Today, that. there was an effort at damage control. And I am also on that list. The BBC that announcing that several of its top male news presenters anything, have agreed to reduced salaries. I support my female colleagues who've rightly said that they should be paid the same uh, when they're doing the same job. It's, it's just a no-brainer. The great helmsman. Earlier this month, the BBC's China editor, Carrie Gracie, resigned after finding out she earned much less than her male counterparts. Adding insult to injury was this leaked exchange between a top-paid radio host and the BBC's North America editor. <laughs> She's actually We're... suggested that you, you, you should lose money. You know that, don't you? You've read the thing properly, have you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have. Yeah. Yep. Next week, Kerry Gracie and the Director General of the BBC, Tony Hall, are due to appear before a select committee of MPs, along with the Director of News and Current Affairs. MP Jo Stevens is on the committee. She calls the BBC move panicky, one that won't resolve discriminatory practices. This is not for individual male employees of the BBC to make a gesture or volunteer to have their pay cut. You know, the BBC management needs to solve this problem. The BBC was forced to publish the salaries of employees making more than £150,000, that's about $260,000, last summer. Only a third were women and none were among the seven highest earners. An investigation into the BBC's pay structure will be released next week. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. So how does the BBC's pay gap compare to elsewhere? It's actually about half the UK average. In OECD countries, women earn 16% less than men. Canada has its own pay gap, women earning 87 cents for every dollar earned by male workers in 2015. With the Grammy Awards coming up on Sunday, we're looking at an occupational hazard for singers. 
Next on The National, how their passion for performing can put those golden tones at risk. Singers love to go on stage and go full out. Yeah. And I always tell them, on the nights when you're hurting, maybe you're fighting off a cold, maybe you're fighting off a flu, you have got to learn containment. And that is one of the hardest things for a great performer because they want to give a thousand percent every night. Well, take that. In the world of cyberspace, a message sent in capital letters like that one is a real no-no. It's like picking up the phone and shouting at the person on the other end. Well, so how do you communicate emotion on the internet? Well, those clever internet cadets have come up with a special set of symbols and a code of conduct called, of course, netiquette. And joining me now from the midday office to show us how to behave in the wired world is Jim Carroll, author of the Canadian Internet Handbook. Hi, Jim. Hi there. So if I write to you on the Internet in uppercase letters, uh, it's really rude? People get stressed about it. I mean, it's difficult to read. It's, it's, it's difficult to understand. It's, it's not easy to read. And people get a little bit uh, concerned about that type of typing. My goodness. So I guess there's a whole way you have to operate when you're writing on the on the internet. Can you give us a few of the basics? Well, the psychologists have actually studied it, and I guess the, the key problem is that you don't see the normal body language of, of somebody speaking when you're sending electronic uh, communications through the internet. So there's oh. a few things you don't do. You don't send capitals, uh, stuff all in capitals. People call that shouting, uh, and they do say it's difficult to use. Uh, another thing is that when you <laughs> write a note, you shouldn't copy in everybody. It's, it's very easy. Um, to send a message to the president of the organization and send the same message to 300 people at the same time, uh, that certainly causes a lot of people stress because, I mean, people simply start to get um, too much electronic mail. It's, it's too easy to copy in too many people. Uh, and probably the third thing, it happens to a lot of people, it's a really strange development, but what happens with people on electronic mail is they can write something that they might not otherwise say or ever put on paper. Uh, they can get very angry very quickly and type, uh, type with anger into the keyboard uh, we call that flaming, uh, and, in, and inevitably flaming. somebody flaming. Somebody <laughs> does it at some point. At some point, somebody using electronic mail will send something, and they'll they'll really regret it later because they'll say things that they didn't mean to say. So you actually have a term for uh, people who are angry who are writing notes. Oh yeah, and it happens regularly. You can see messages from people. You wonder why did they ever send me that? Boy, they must have been in a really bad mood. Uh, when they typed it out. Amazing. All right. Well, is there a site on the internet where you can find all the things you should and shouldn't do? And there's there's all kinds of sites. Psychologists are studying it. Sociologists are, are studying it. It's, it's 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 really a point of fascination for a lot of people. Uh, this is an example site that we have here: a beginner's guide to effective electronic mail, and it gives you a lot of tips and pointers uh, about what you should be doing in your messages, what you shouldn't be doing, um, how to write the message, how to enunciate uh, the, some of the key points that you're trying to make, the fact that you shouldn't type in capitals. Just uh, some of the do's and don'ts of the information ah. highway. Now, there are all these symbols that you can use for uh, communicating. And what are some of those symbols? Well, uh, people call them emoticons. I guess people came up with emoticons? other methods. <laughs> emoticons? Uh, and it means emotion icons. And, and oh, people I came see. up with methods to, to say, you know, this is, this is uh, how you can get across that you're happy, that you're, uh, that you're sad, that you're angry. Um, or that you're winking at someone. And what they do is they type in little computer symbols um, and uh, when you look at them sideways, they represent something. Okay, so um, the first one we saw there was happy and this one, when uh, the happy one is on its side, what does that tell us? Uh, that tells us it's a happy face. Uh, and that means if you look at it sideways, there's the mouth, there's the nose, and there's the, uh, the two eyes. On the next Heartland. What do you care if I stay if I go? You're feeling all right? Dealing with some serious issues and some less so. I'm back for our big reunion. I'm helping to organize it. It's like a cute throwback to high school. Heartland, Sunday at 7 on CBC. She's always dealt with grief oddly. When my mother died, she skipped school and spent the day alphabetizing my cosmetics. Like a psychopath. 
I stumbled upon Ted in the cafe this morning. He seemed quite taken with an older woman. I can't believe he's still dating Heather. Alexis came by this morning and was really adamant that we go out tonight. Sometimes in life and in love, risks must be taken. And the Billboard Music Award goes to Sam Smith. Sam Smith was speechless when he won that Billboard Music Award. He thanked people with cue cards because he was recovering from vocal cord surgery. Now, Smith is okay now, but vocal strain can put a singer out of business. Canadian Michael Bublé is up for a Grammy Award this Sunday. Just 18 months ago, after his own surgery, he feared his career might be over. Eli Glasner wanted to know the cause and the cure, so listen up. Quand il me prend dans ses bras. This is what fans of Sophie Millman pay to hear. Je vois la vie en... And this is what she does to keep singing after losing her voice due to vocal cord damage. It's actually better. Better than it was four days ago. In the exam room of Dr. Jennifer Anderson, the jazz singer's vocal cords are getting a checkup. Anderson is one of a handful of doctors in Canada who specialize in vocal cord surgery. With a special camera, she looks to see whether the swelling has gone down. That's the right vocal cord. This is the left vocal cord. And what we've been tracking... Anderson shows us footage of Millman from last May when she was struggling. Look closely on the left cord. This little bump was the beginning of a polyp. So and that is the swelling a, of the vocal cords. It's a swelling. It's like an early polyp. To take the swelling down, brace yourself. Anderson injected a steroid. So there you go, two drops of steroid right into the polyp. It may seem drastic, but Millman isn't alone. Celine Dion, Shakira, Shania Twain, Adele, and Sam Smith all canceled concerts and even tours due to vocal cord issues driven by increasing demands on performers. Promoters and presenters and agents, they don't care that much about fatigue and things. I mean, I go to Japan, I play two shows a night, night after night after night, jet lag. Flashback to the year 2000, album sales were the music industry's biggest source of revenue. Now with the shift to digital music, it's live concerts. Whether it's Beyonce, Guns N' Roses, or Bruce Springsteen, in 2016, the bulk of their revenue came from concerts and touring. But besides the business, the other factor in vocal cord strain is the big voice singing style. If you put too much tension, too much muscle tension on your vocal cords, then you end up with vocal cord swelling. And it's often reversible, so you might do that one night and the next few bit husky and it goes away. But as you repeat that, then you end up with vocal cord swelling that's not reversible in a short time. The voice starts to change. Okay. We hold a lot of tension, and the tension from the back uh -huh. of the neck goes into the vocal cord area. When singers start losing their voice, they may end up at Elaine Overholt's piano. Many performers are thrust out into the world uh, with no training, no even idea how to warm up, no set of skills. She says it's better to build up stamina rather than go under the knife. You don't want to have surgery if possible because it can, not always, but it can alter the voice. Overholt tells students to conserve their voice. Not an easy job for a musician on the road. When I get on stage, I sort of, I let it all go. And I want to please the audience, I want to make them happy. So I will push and do everything I can to make them happy and to s in the moment. And then I pay for it. Caught between performing and protecting their most delicate instrument. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Freddie Mercury refused to have nodules removed, fearing permanent vocal damage. Some singers embrace the raspy sound that can follow surgery, like Bonnie Tyler and this guy. Now it's she's in me, always with me. Tiny dancer in my hand. So we actually
actually showed you this a few days ago, Elton John in his early career years before his surgery in 1987 to remove nine growths he has that are now called cancerous. How's this for comparison? You can tell everybody What a difference, deeper, richer, and according to the man himself, better. Some fans have told him they miss his falsetto. Elton John says he still sings his songs in the original key. His voice is just more resonant. Well, you can tell in his concerts now, he does skip some of those uh, high parts. Some of you across the country may be thinking of the legendary Tommy Banks tonight, a renowned jazz pianist, variety television show host, and a former senator. Banks had a career that started young and earned respect around the world. He died yesterday in Edmonton, surrounded by family. Tommy Banks made his professional debut as a teenager back in the 1950s. But it didn't take long before his talents took him from the stage to the studio. It's Tommy Banks Live! The Tommy Banks Show ran on CBC television from 1968 to 1983, where he interviewed hundreds of Canadians. But when you're coming down the ice at the goalkeeper, it'll get me at any rate. I can't even see where the puck is. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if you got it in your mouth or what. <laughs> Unbelievable. And showcase great music. Something in the way he moves. He was appointed to the Senate in the year 2000. And I'm also a political neophyte as far as internal party stuff is concerned. But he never strayed too far from his first love, a fierce advocate of music education. Music should be a capital A academic subject. It should be in every school and mentor to countless artists. Tommy Banks was 81. My mama done told me when I was in knee pants, a woman will bring you the blues, blues in the night. My mama was right. Call it Tommy Mania. In the very church where Tommy Douglas preached, his adoring fans, many old friends of the man, gathered to cheer him on. For every man, woman, and child, irrespective of their income, their age, or their business or After weeks of suspense, the CBC's greatest Canadian would be revealed. There was no doubt who the people's choice was here. Well, I'm a strong supporter of Tommy Douglas. I think he's done such a great thing for our Canada. He's an amazing man. A woman tells me her doctor. Douglas was Saskatchewan's premier from 1944 to 1961, but his greatest legacy, championing universal health care. Medical care is so important that it ought not to have a price tag on it. Glenn Rasmussen worked on Douglas's election campaigns. Well, there's great Canadians, but I think he is one of the greatest. Is he the greatest? I think he is the greatest. It was time to find out if enough Canadians agreed. Tommy! right it's absolutely a one and he's the right choice it's just absolutely perfect <laughs> the people have really spoken and it shows what a great man he was Tommy Douglas never became Prime Minister but in this contest he beat three of them and nowhere was the victory sweeter than here <laughs> Dean Gutile CBC News Weyburn you didn't have politicians arguing for politicians etc and I thought it was great to see Terry Fox do as well as he did. So, uh, but again, I think it was uh, fairly predictable to see uh, someone like Tommy Douglas to, to win. So, uh, but overall it was entertaining. My wife and I voted for Banting, but he came fourth. So, uh, no, it was a good idea. Good, good, uh, nice to have a, a different perspective on thing and it gives you something to watch since there's no ice available. Well, I thought it was kind of a big disappointment because Don Cherry didn't win, neither did Wayne Gretzky.
this March, the Pyeongchang 2018 Paralympic Games are coming to CBC, Canada's Paralympic Network. There's growing concern over flooding in and around Paris. As the Seine River continues to rise, roads along the river banks were closed, as was a section of the Louvre. But things are worse in the outskirts of the city. Soldiers have helped hundreds of people leave their homes, and thousands have lost power. The mayor of Paris says the flooding is a reminder that the city must adapt to climate change. <laughs> You can't really see what's going on in all of this chaos, but that is a horde of people going after jars of Nutella in France. Supermarkets across the country reported similar scenes after the chain Intermarché dropped the price of the heavenly chocolate and hazelnut spread. The promotion had jars on sale for about $2 Canadian, down from the usual price of about $7. That was all it took to send shoppers scrambling. When I wake up, well, I know if those big budget American ads are your favorite part of the Super Bowl, we have some good news for you tonight. The Supreme Court of Canada went all the way to the Supreme Court, has rejected an attempt by Bell to block them from airing on Canadian TVs during the year's event those ads. You'll still be able to see them if you're watching in Canada on an American channel. I hope that you will welcome somebody in this chair and be as kind and generous to them as you have been to me for a very long time. Thank you. I don't have to tell those of you in Nova Scotia, that was veteran CBC Radio host Don Connolly signing off today for the final time. For 42 years, his was the voice that woke up so many in the province on CBC's Information Morning. All today, his friends and loyal listeners packed an event in downtown Halifax to celebrate his career. I had the pressure, pleasure of listening to him when I lived in Halifax in the 80s. He was already legendary. What a career. So here's something getting a lot of attention today. The 25th edition of Vanity Fair is popular Hollywood issue, but the star-studded lineup is grabbing headlines because of who is not on the cover. Turns out the magazine chose to digitally remove James Franco after learning of sexual misconduct allegations made against him. And that's not all people were paying attention to online. Take a closer look at this. There's Reese Witherspoon leaning on Oprah and what appears to be Witherspoon's third leg. And there's more. Another photo published on Vanity Fair's website appears to show Oprah with a third hand. So... so I, Odd. Uh, these women don't seem all that bothered by that. Uh, sort of Reese Witherspoon and Oprah were tweeting at each other, uh, I guess, as you do. And, uh, you know, Reese Witherspoon said, ah, I guess everybody knows by now I have a third leg. I hope, hope you can accept me. To which Oprah said, you know, I accept your third leg if you accept my third <laughs> hand. Two things I would say, Adrian. First of all, it was a nice resolution to what I thought was going to be another story about altering women's uh, <laughs> images on major magazines. Everybody had fun with it because really there's not an image about extra limbs. Also, the next time I'm back in Toronto in the atrium, I need to take a second look at the picture of the four of us, <laughs> you know, in the lobby because I haven't counted limbs yet. <laughs> Ouch. Okay. That is <laughs> national for January 26th. Good night. Think about it. Good night. Good night.